click on the sound. I, I had an idea for um, a sort of writing workshop, and it was rhyming words. And one of the the uh, couplets was rupture and rapture, and I thought that would make a good lecture, rather a good workshop. So I never did the workshop, um, and it's a sort of bit of experiments. But the words are immeasurable. Trauma, eruption, gesture, writing, fiction, difference, crisis, stranger's abyss. So I've got to make something out of this. The time is dismal, punctured and ruptured, but it is still our time to make of it what comes to us. Many shrink from having to enjoy the news from what might what it might present. For some, it is as if everything is already written. So if this is a case, so it's just a case of waiting. Oops. So I'd like to read, I want to share the reading. So someone read, Victor read. <clears throat> Can you read Victor? Yes. <clears throat> Modernism was that experience of being cast between anticipation and waiting, of being caught in a crosswind of elation and melancholia. If modernity was composed out of a secret handwriting then it too readily evoked the void in order not to translate or find an answer for this. This seemed to be a way of seeing why modernity was always predicated on being its own question. Either side of a given image is, an other, is other images, but above the image is simply a void signified by blackness. Sharon, could you read this? She was never certain if the look preceded gesture, gesture the look, or if both were joined together. And then there was an even deeper mystery of what preceded any given image and what came after, because the idea of there being a still image is a stimulation of such unanswerable questions. Could you read it again? Sure. She was never certain if the look preceded gesture, gesture the look, or if both were joined together. And then there was an even deeper mystery of what preceded any given image and what came after, because the idea of there being a still image is the stim stimulation of such unanswerable questions. Sharon read again. She had the intuition that one eye looked outwards into the light and one eye looked inwards toward the dark. This would be a way of explaining why there was a division between the look and the gaze. But then this was just an intuition and had no theoretical foundation. These are Fayyam portraits from Egypt, sort of influence between a mutation between Roman, Greco Roman art and Egyptian art. So they're roughly 2,000 years, over 2,000 years old. They are looking back, dissolving two, two centuries in the process, in the process. 
to be so it shouldn't be two centuries in order in the process in order to touch upon the mutability of time expended to my On the retreat from the day, there might be the sensation of, re of, of recalling faces as if assembled on a wall or a screen. So many faces simply passing through as if recorded by a mere blink of the eye. Round and round they go without progression. An image is like that sometimes, always tracing a circular motion around itself. This is an image of being served up. It can appear like that, sliced up and served without means of escape. Images can be presented as if served up, but sometimes they serve us up. Sharon. Her name was Lily O, oh, and her father was Italian, and her mother was Chinese. O oh stood for emptiness, and her mother who died before she could remember her. She grew up in Italy and went to the university in Bologna, and she partook in the uprising there in 1977. And continue. Someone asked me if I have ever felt at home. I wondered how it is possible to have that kind of attachment. Well, at least in my case. Instead of having a long-term home, I have traveled a lot. This is not in opposition to settling down, but rather it is a way of following what comes before me. I have always had the sense that I would prefer my ashes to be scattered in the wind as opposed to being buried in one place. I do not wish to be visited after I'm gone, even though I would welcome passing thoughts because I think they might linger in the sky for my dust to savor. Okay, continue. Sometimes I feel short of breath. I think it is connected to all those dreams. They eat away at me, but then there should be no shame in that. My father always said he wanted to retire and go and live in the mountains. He said his main desire was for clean air. But even if I went with him to the mountains, I still think I might feel short of breath. Someone once said that culture was the air we breathe. So we might be in trouble with breathing now because other forces are consuming culture, leaving it, leaving it like air short of oxygen. Leo kept a notebook throughout her life, which was filled with ideas about writing, art and politics. This was in part inspired by the notebooks of Simone Veil. Sharon. The art of Rose Wiley is not pre predicated on not, on not what an image is, but what it might become. And with this, an impression emerges of a flickering indeterminacy that gestures the futural, futural aspect of image presentation. Soaking up images as if from the underneath of the present, they are in turn subject to play upon both memory and imagination, with both registers being so close to the other as to be indivisible. It is as if the temporalities of images are both being both stretched out but equally contracted, a pulse. We are thus invited to release preoccupations with the immediate sensation of the image for an encounter closer to pulsation through which images themselves are formed. The emergent image is marked by a sense of contingency, uncertain of the fixing that is secured by the act of naming. She loved Japanese Bhutto because of the way it was transported her into a border region between the realm of the living and the realm of the dead. Bodies powdered white and rendered stark in subdued light, moving in surprising ways to open up the relationship between the body and space. A 
presentation and self-exhibition, the congregation of gestures and occupation of a force field, immersion into the empire of silence, a release into new nuances of undoing. And so it goes on, the rapture of, of difference. And so it is, this half-life spasmed intent and intense electric on the edge of a border region that divides life and death there isn't anywhere beyond this but it is the case of shuddering at the edge of this and presenting this condition with a feeling of raptures release raptures released from the passage which had been endured Jessica, could you read this? <clears throat> the bodies stand before, simply there, form forming form within a radiation of light, a shining forth in obscure connection, perhaps in turn true. They are speaking in the language of gesture about the sense of, of measure within things, but as performers, they touch upon the immeasurable. She liked all kinds of music, especially what she termed ecstatic music, which implicated a passage into the unknown or the elsewhere. Gustav Villiet Kahn was the medium of a sound that linked the concert hall with the elsewhere of space. He was a cosmic wanderer or a dervish of the skies. Billie Holiday transported her voice to, to her limit. There was no hiding place from this exposure to the outside. Watching Bob Marley perform was like witnessing a trance medium in action. I'm not really certain if his music was there in order to pass through or whether or not he became a cipher for the passage through him. What was interior and exterior simply became blurred. Antoine Nato developed the idea of theatre of cruelty, which was based on gesture preceding language. He also developed new phrases such as body without organs and subjectile, which are all terms with, that still circulate within the present cultural circuit. Sharon. Far from identifying with the emergence from the cave to gaze at high noon of reality, Arto thinks that modern consciousness suffers from a lack of shadows. The remedy is to remain in the cave but devise better spectacles. The theatre that Arto, Arto pro proposes will serve consciousness by naming and directing shadows and destroying false shadows to prepare the way for a new generation of shadows around which will assemble the true spectacle of life. Otto played the role of a monk in Carl Dreyer's silent film, The Passion of Joan of Arc, in 1928. Her face conveys both the absolute torment, but also the rapture of martyrdom. Mm. Otto was confined to asylums in order to treat his mental conditions, and it was in Rodas in 1943 that he's he started to be treated with electroshock treatment. In this com confinement, he produced numerous drawings in his notebooks. Victor. The word subjectile resists translation, but it carries within its construction a sense that carries 
an operative movement between subject matter and object or support. It is the conjunction of being thrown out of place and the subject in place, a projectile becoming pressed under as an interval between above and below, visible and invisible, before and behind, this side and that. You read it again. The word, subje the word subjectile resists translation, but it carries within its construction a sense that carries an operative movement between subject matter and object or support. It is the conjunction of being thrown out of place and the subject in place, a projectile becoming pressed under as an interval between above and below visible and invisible, before and behind, this side and that. <clears throat> Jesse. Imagine witnessing the figure of Artaud after his delicate brain had been turned ashen with convulsive electrical inputs. In his drawings, images flicker intermittently intim Mittingly breaking the composure of pre-established logic, a strange mixture of excess and emptiness. Now ashen faced with electrical storms endured in which flickers of light within the dark recess of eyeballs serve to circulate broken images. All of this serving to arrange and rearrange again and again in a non-stop theater of becoming staging at the threshold regions of despair. Sharon, your Lilio. That's a big honor. Torment. Arto was sickness tormented. He scraped his soul raw. No one could taste his ejected matter made waste. Words jettisoned into pus as he looked at himself as double. Images leaking as if discharged, disrupting the rationalist networks of language and looping regressively back into time, leaving him raw and accessed to death. Entering the stage of narrative without words, a new spatial poetry was born, soaked in cruelty, disordered and beyond control. In order to reveal the lava of the inhumane, Arto pulverized the world of objects to enter the fluidity of nerves. He burnt up silence, creating the potentiality of explosion within a glare, eyes pointing into the void. Sharon again. I remember going to see Jean-Luc Godard's film Vivre Sa Vie, 1962, and being riveted by the scene when Nana goes to the cinema to see Carl Dreyer's film The Passion of Joan of Arc. In a sequence of close-ups, we first see the tearful face of Joan, and this is then cut to the face of Nana, which eventually seems to be crying in conjunction to Joan's tears. Somehow the absorption of this sequence is total and reverberates through the rest of the remaining film until she herself is killed. Both faces are haunting, sinking back into the silence left by the withdrawal of language. Victor. Language can only begin with the void. No, plenty, no plenitude, no certainty can ever speak. Something essential is lacking in anyone who expresses himself. Negation is tied to language. When I first begin, I do not speak in order to say something. Rather, a nothing demands to speak. Nothing speaks. Nothing finds in speech and the being of speech is nothing. This formulation explains why literature's ideal has been this, to speak and say nothing.
The more one talks, the less words mean. The pleasure of the text is a moment when my body pursues its own ideas. Jessica. Text of bliss, the text that imposes a state of loss, the text that discomforts, perhaps to the point of a certain boredom, unsettles the reader's historical, cultural, psychological assumptions, the consistency of his tastes, values, memories, brings to a crisis his relation with language. Words should mix the vapor bodies in order that their passion might become the juice of the mind. Sharon. In his later writings, Merleau-Ponty introduced the concept of flesh to describe a single but complex chiasmic, chias, chiasmic? Right. intertwining nature and culture, object and subject, self and other. Flesh is anchored and embodied in the human life world and is the source of ethical inquiry because of the reflex of reversibility inscribed within it. Flesh coils over upon itself, being both subject and object, sensing and sensible at the same time. Between the seeing subject and the world as seen, there exists an encroachment. As soon as I see, it is necessary that the vision be doubled with complementary vision or with another vision, myself seen from without, such as another would see me installed in the midst of the visible, occupied in considering it from a certain spot. The reversibility of flesh means that the self is also the other of its own self. Alterity does not confront the subject from the outside, but is inscribed within it as a source of intersubjectivity. If my left hand can touch my right hand while it palpitates the tangibles, can touch it, can touch it touching, can turn its palpit palpitation back upon it why when touching the hand of another would i not touch it in the same power to espouse things that i have to touching uh, touched in my own flesh is thus a metaphorical circle or fold When Jackson Pollock was asked about the influences of his gestural style, his list included the Navajo paintings he'd seen in 1940 at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Finding yourself within the painting as, as you work on it is something that pertains to these cultures, he added. The Navajo call their sun paintings Ikea, which literally means places where the gods come and go. Sharon. By writing herself, woman will return to the body which has been more than confiscated from her, which has been turned into the uncanny stranger on display, the ailing or dead figure, which so often turns out to be the nasty companion the cause and location of inhibitions. Sense of the body and you sense the breath and speech at the same time. Write yourself, your body must be heard. Only then will the immense resource of the unconscious spring forth. Jessica. When the starry sky, a vista of open seas, or a stained glass window shedding purple beams, fascinate me, there is a cluster of meaning, of colours, of words, of caresses. There are light touches, scents, sighs, cadences that arise, shroud me, carry me away, and sweep me beyond the things I see, hear, or think. The sublime object dissolves in the raptures of a bottomless memory. It is such a memory which from stopping point to stopping point, remembrance to remembrance, love to love, 
transfers that object to the refulgent point of bedazzlement in which I stray in order to be. It's a pretty impressive paragraph. Sharon, Lilio. <laughs> what I remember about Bologna more than anything else was the experiment in language. People learned to speak and listen in new ways. The musicality of words overwhelmed the precision of economies of meaning in order that invention might open out new spaces of reception. Anyway, I first became conscious of this on the streets and through the radio, but also later in clubs and the bedroom. I guess I, it can be found anywhere, but it is rare, more like an eruption. A bit like freedom, really. That is, an eruption. For a moment, I thought it was possible to open out a new universe of sounds and cadences, but it requires an extraordinary relationship to time in order to endure. I am certain that this was not the case of confusing noise with the inclination towards the profound. I think that my sound works are an attempt to sustain a relationship with this event. There is a politics to what I do, but it is not obvious because I dislike staging historical passages. Radio Alice was a free radio station in Bologna from 1973 to 1977, rather than attempting to objectify events in the world, they set out to create a flow of sounds, information, passages and poetry, silence and abuse. Like, ma like the manifestation of Dada, transmissions were seen as an immediate cultural subversion. Sharon. Lilio. At this moment, I start to think about the body, but not the physical body, but rather the subtle body with its myriad of energy centers. Each of the confluences is constituted as a center of emotions and spatial awareness. This is an inner resource because everything is recorded there. You could even think of the self as a vast recording machine in which not a thing is lost. The point is that this vast virtuality of sense awaiting a recoding process but the problem is that they are whirling at speeds that make this information simply appear as sensation. I am feeling depressed means a slow, heavy sensation that blocks the smooth passage of words and thus we withdraw or dissent. Usually the desire is to escape from such sensations in order to displace it through other sensations that might be triggered by drink or drugs. What we are, either not understanding or recognizing is that there is a form of intelligence in each of these states, no matter how unwanted. Each state gives us a possibility which we can either block or transform. On a simple level, this process constitutes an economy of our energy field. Language and gesture enables us to connect or to block our economies of energy. If there is no energy connection and exchange, then there is a sensation of either blockage or non-communication. And continue. Words advance on the page incessantly, and yet they leave traces of other things such as gaps, interruptions, marks, and withdrawals. It is through these things that writing retains within itself a complex coil awaiting release. continue a sea of eyes a myriad of intertwining bodies a carnival of fantastical delight the stretching of earthly bodies into the shores of the unknown multiplicities warping and becoming charged with intensities the ecstatic encounters with the elsewhere are but snapshot phrases with this state of, the, of exception that we might term the art of marlene stain this state of exception involves the warping and weaving heterogeneous cultural references into a confederation of hybridity that introduces an aesthetics of unbounded excess.
Enrico David's work, in, in Enrico David works in the gap of what is seeable and sayable. His universe is peopled by strangers, strangers to themselves as much <coughs> as much as to others. Victor. I have spent my life in a labyrinth consisting of words and images, constantly trying to see into blind spots and read into ap aporias. Art is only art because it dares to touch upon the impossibility of being insightful when faced by such knots which mark the process of becoming. Art is like a scar tissue that shows the process of exposure as opposed to a result called through knowing. John Basida created a video work of him simply weeping called I'm Too Sad to Tell You. His last work was setting, setting out across the Atlantic in a small sailing boat. He simply disappeared. Sharon. Money has to move to towards a condition of its own exhaustion. This is inevitable. I feel I am being pushed up against different modes of exhaustion. The two modes of exhaustion simply corrode each other. There is no inside or outside to this system in which trauma and crisis become coextensive. some of the references. Thoughts. It's a very unusual one. That's my it question. is. It's a experiment. Mm. Mm. I'm trying to get away with one. <laughs> I'm trying to I, try it out. I'm. I, I have to say, I loved it, but um, this this here's my ignorance. Having been Lilio for the whole lecture, I, I have no idea of her work or. Um, who she is? Um, in fiction. Is that is that your fiction? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't feel so bad. <laughs> I was thinking she must be someone that I should have studied if I was a sculptor student or something. You should study her. <laughs> <laughs> Intensely. <laughs> In a way, you kind of have studied her. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Well, we get to meet her at the Indian curry night. <laughs> <laughs> I have a wig you can borrow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I didn't want a stable voice. I didn't want one, one voice running through. I wanted a uh, sort of sense of multiplicity of voices, which are not single authorship. Um, so she cared within, a, a, I wrote a novel, which she was one of the main figures. Um, so she, she was in Bologna in, the late seventies in the riots in Bologna, and then went to Central Saint Martins and studied fashion, and uh, did did th then made these experimental sound works, which disappeared. Um, she she died. 
in keeping with disappearance of her work. So she left some poems and some small, she collected found objects, but only if they cost a pound. She did a deconstruction of collecting. And then how did she disappear? She, she died of um, cancer. Her father was Italian, her mother was Chinese. Her, her mother died when she was, before she was two. So she took the name Lily O because the, the O reminded of her mother that she can't visualize, but she has a sense of her mother as a kind of circle. And was this the fictional exhibition that you put on once? Yeah, I put on a fictional exhibition of Lilio. Do you have any photos from that exhibition? Yeah, a few. It would be nice to see them someday. Yeah. Mm. But I was working with fiction quite often, like with different characters. Like there was one where someone went to prison and uh, so I always had a second, a second character as fiction. So the exhibition was a fiction rather than a kind of, it was more of a fiction than a show. And what sort of freedoms did that afford you that you found you couldn't have doing what you normally do as a creative? Oh, it's immense. I can say anything and do anything. Did you paint that painting that you showed with her too? Yeah. How big is it? It's about um, this big. Okay. Do you, th do you think we'll ever discover any more of the archive of her? Well, I was thinking of doing, I was thinking of do, doing at some point sound works, sound and voice works. There's a collection of poetry that she wrote. It's like she left found objects and poetry and some elementary scripts. I know that like Duchamp had uh, his uh, alter ego, Rose Selavi, but are there other artists who also worked with a similar kind of um alter ego, particularly like a female alter ego or something like that? Um, not that I know of. I always forget this. There's, in America, there was quite a famous example. It was a trio. This was like at the height of the AIDS um, epidemic in in the States. And they, I forget now, but there was, there was three of them, but they made their own collective, uh, you know, fake identity um, and put on works through his, I can't, well, I can't remember who it was, but yeah. One of writers, I mean, George Bataille famously wrote his pornography under a pseudonym, Lord Ark. There's a modern, um, a contemporary version of this, which are these uh, computer generated people. They look like real people, but they are like Instagram celebrities or they're fashion models. And there's there's a few that have like there's a, there's a writer behind them. They kind of write the story around them and then they they look like completely real pictures or real people that have these whole lives, but then they become like, some are more like art projects, some are more like marketing stunts to create, well, yeah, um, more tailored to be like the most viral or successful. But especially now when you can um, generate essentially photos and permutate photos very, very simply. It's going to be a genre that, or like a, something that we see more and more of, like a lot of people on the internet that are not real, but they have real faces, real pictures, real lives. Um, yeah, I was reading an interesting article at the weekend about AI generated art, and that was like focused on <clears throat> um, models where you type instructions and then it, um you know it just has a 
a database of hundreds of millions of images. Um, and so, you know, you say, I want, uh, you know, a, a, a woman sitting in front of a desk, you know, looking anxious as somebody's, you know, calling her on the phone or something. And you, you just like type the sentence and it produces the image of the sentence that you described um, and how this is, you know, starting to be used as a, um, you know, form of art making, which I think is like kind of super interesting for this group, actually, isn't it? Because we, um, you know, we're exploring this like angle between uh, art and writing um, and visuals and text. And this is like, Maybe we should do that as an exercise because I think I don't know whether you've said it, whether there are any of these are free resources. It probably is one that's free, um, but maybe we take like a writing exercise and use it to literally generate images. You know, I think it's like on the one hand, it's kind of potentially very depressing, right? Um, you don't without any artistic skill whatsoever, you can you can create. Um, uh, images but on the other hand you know what would writing for visual effect look like you know um and uh and yeah i have a like an intuition that it would like encourage at least me to be a lot more poetic i think um and just like try out you know fantastical combinations um you know like so this like the article was saying for example so <clears throat> you know if uh you know you might have you know hundreds or thousands and thousands of images of dogs and then hundreds and thousands of images of people doing yoga and although there's never been a dog that's done yoga or they don't necessarily have to have that image if you type i want to see a dog doing yoga then the software combines like the the shapes from yoga with the form of a dog and will attempt to come up with something um, that is a dog doing yoga, which is pretty astonishing if that that's literally all you have to do is type. Yeah, I want to see a dog doing yoga. I spent like a couple of nights doing this because there I could share the free tools with you. I'm just going to share like to give an example of the stuff that's created. I can share these. We were just uh, let me just share the screen this screen um can you, share, can you see my screen mm -hmm. so this is like a bush turkey on a rocket in outer space <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is like uh, maybe i can show it this way i think this is better where do i have no it's better show here um this is a lonely dog with a suitcase near near an airplane photo in old image style um, you can you can kind of specify how what kind of like image you want like an illustration from a certain era or highly detailed or mm -hmm. this is five hot girls bidding at an auction <laughs> <laughs> i'm concerned about the rick astley one is that you what you look like going no out sometimes i mean i don't know if you know about this but um <laughs> There is a meme on the internet that uh, if somebody sends you the link and it opens up the 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 YouTube video, I'm never gonna give you up. Uh, <laughs> it's a way of tricking people. So I don't know why, but somehow the 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 machine sometimes just tries to pull a trick on you. This is an old couple having a pillow fight in the clouds, airplanes in the sky. Uh, what is the complete name? Mm. So like this is something that it just created uh, by itself. Mm, which is like astonishing, isn't it, really? Yeah. It really is astonishing. This is a good one. Ten ducks dancing in a ring of fire. <laughs> I know. <laughs> My kid, because they sent me one that was like a cat turning into a unicorn that's also a fighter plane. Yeah. And it's the morphing that it was able to do because of the words turning into. So I'm going to go look for that image because it was. This is five hot girls hula hooping in Mexico in the style of Frida Kahlo painting. <laughs> <laughs> so like it doesn't really get a lot of things like the hula hoops are now the feet. I mean, there's like <laughs> there's the way that 
the machine doesn't understand reality, but it kind of fuses these things together, which can create quite a sometimes rather interesting uh, results. This is a good one. Three tigers chasing a Toyota Hilux in Australia during World War Two. But instead, there's three, three. It just it doesn't know how to count either. So it will make three, uh, three Jeeps chasing a tiger. I don't know. These are like examples of what's like pr present now. Italian gangsters driving cars around New York. Um, yeah, I just it's pretty cool what it can do, but uh, how do I stop sharing? Yeah, there's no stop sharing button. Oh my God, how do I stop sharing? Stop sharing. Okay, what? Well, we're, st we're stuck in a loop. I'm stuck in a loop. <laughs> I don't know how I stopped sharing, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> the button is gone, so. That's it, we're in here now. Yeah. Mm. The red button in the corner, isn't there? Yeah, well, I mean, it seems to have disappeared. Jonathan, what do you make of this technology? Have you come across this before? Yeah. I there was a sort of polemic about it in a, another sort of seminar group. And I wrote a thing on finitude about the difference between a sort of bad infinity that they, it generates uh, endlessness and self replication. And uh, the danger that it becomes just bad infinity, which is a term of Hegel. So that you just endlessly mutate and repeat mm -hmm. and there's no aesthetic interruption mm. I'll be back. Oh, <laughs> not sharing the screen. <laughs> in the late 60s, there was this um, saying about the only thing which divided formalist painters was whether or not they used masking tape or not, cottage painting. And what happened is that um, there was going to be a meeting, a polemic about art and society in the 1970s, I think it was. Uh, I'd heard this kind of comment once in the postgraduate studio about people who use masking tape or didn't. So I, I uh, said the only difference, I, I made a, a talk about uh, the only difference in painting is whether you use masking tape or not. <laughs> and anyway, 50 years later, he's quoting this as if it's got no, <laughs> as if it's true, an art historical fact, but it was a kind of bit of cheekiness on my part. And maybe about 20 years ago, I, I did a lecture in which I, I sort of said, said this, and it's kind of morphed into a kind of, <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, you know, it's got Be no careful authorship. what you say. <laughs> There's, no authorship. There's no one who says, it's not <laughs> quoting me. So it's kind of, everyone laughs. They think it's hilarious. They think it's kind of a truism, mm -hmm. but it was a p piece of mischief, really. I'm interested in how stories kind of create images and become part of the culture. So, I mean, it's a different form of virtuality, but one which is long standing. It's been working over the last 50 years. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it doesn't like, it seems to me like uninteresting as like, a way to just spin out images that you know that we've all that we can recognize or that we've seen before but i'm quite curious about <clears throat> trying to create like impossible images with it 
you know, or things which, which for whatever reason are not realizable and seeing what you can get. I'm sure it would be like hugely trial and error. Most 99 of them would just be rubbish, but you know, <clears throat> um, I think that's, that's definitely how I would, like if I was going to use it at all, it would be more enticing if I was going to try and use it to not represent reality than the other way around. But, but haven't a heart has always done this? I mean, it, it's kind exactly. of like, it's a mashup tool, really. It's exactly. kind of like a, a car crash tool of like, put this with this and then mm -hmm. put this in this scenario and then ta-da, this is what. So it's almost like, I mean, a, as a creative visual person, it feels like it's just like a bit of a, a tool more than anything else. I don't, it's I being do know to Manet's um, Bonabageur. I mean, in a way that's an impossible image. So we've had in art history, I mean, you look at some of Titian's drawing of heads on bodies, and they're impossible. Um, so we've always had this kind of exaggeration or a way of kind of spontaneously understanding collage within painting as something which prefigures actual collage. And there's always been a sort of form, there's always been forms in which two, three centuries before something happens, art historically, it's already happened. We just haven't seen it. Um, I haven't recognized it, but it's... A lot of the um, feeling about modernity now is that it's modernist forms of art, is that they've all, they've all occurred before the event. They've all had a prefiguration Malavich's black square has already occurred in uh, our chemical literature 300 years before it or um, we we have strange ideas about time because we live in a very narrow time um, I, I was reading a little bit about um, invisible cities by Calvino and uh, Marco Polo went to China in the Yuan Dynasty, so it was when the M Mongols were ruling China. They went to the court of Kublai Khan, and Kublai Khan got him to tell stories about cities. And he, he said, you've told me about every city but not Venice. And he said, well, I, I, I thought I was only telling you about Venice. So. He didn't really know any other city than Venice, but he told them these fabulous stories about cities which had names of women. They, he, and then Kublai Khan got him to travel around China and report back to him. But it was the kind of fiction that he enjoyed of, this, of these cities, not the reality. Uh, the fiction became truer than the uh, reality, so the observation was preceded by fiction or an invention or um, but the true story of Marco Polo is as fabulous as the story of uh, Calvino and that's you know the Yuan dynasty 13th 14th century So I was with this lecture, I was thinking about the fall between fiction and you get a kind of story, but a lot of it's fictional. And you, you kind of believe the character, you believe in, you believe, I mean, I'm sure that voice seemed to be locatable in time or had a certain texture to it, which which kind of didn't feel fiction. You're quiet today, Fabiana. Jo Jonathan, can I ask you yeah. a question about um, the pun and like it being a kind of uh, feature of uh, modernity or mo modernism? Postmodernism, modernism, the pun. So I wondered what, why you thought that was. If you thought deeply about it, you know, why there's the special attraction to pun titles. Punning. 
Pun the punning, yeah. Um, I don't know. Hmm. I, haven't got a, I haven't got a set answer for it. I mean, it, it's a feature of irony, isn't it, which was introduced with postmodernity and irony is connected with the pun. Oh, yeah. Pun. To the speak, ironic. To, to be double. So it's the idea of the fold, which is also um, the work of art having a mask. And the mask, yeah. you know, being a, a figure that, a mask figure who can pun and play another role. So you get simulation, you get in the post postmodern period, you get the figure of simulation coming into the floor. That's so really interesting. Like, play. You get this double play and yeah. humor. You get a kind of certain humor with pun. Sort of bitter humor, That's isn't it? It's the opposite of tragedy. So in a way, I mean, modernity would see itself as based more on the tragic than on pun, whereas the postmodern would see itself more on humour and pun than on tragedy. So if the pun is ironic and it's also a mask, so it's, there's something about duplicity or like... Duplicity uh, and the threat, the threat to the um, seriousness of art that somehow... Um, What's underneath that is an anxiety about art coming to the end or the dissolution of art. But in fact, you get the playfulness of art masking the identity of that anxiety. Right. Like a clown. Yeah. That sort of not very funny, funny, the sad funny. I mean, the contemporary resolve that issue by figures of not fall, but circularities and suspensions. And now we're, we're into a kind of period without a uh, name. So we, we're groping around for a name for what's happening and what's coming and what will fall to us. But there's a certain sort of level of hysteria connected with it, as well as trauma. Mm. The urgency. Well, that's where the rupture comes in, and rupture, rupture is the kind of... Uh, we swing from one to the other. Because it's hopeful. Rupture is hopeful, isn't it? Uh, well, it's inevitable more than hope. It's not, not got a, a mood. Well, there's the hope in it of <coughs> what is next. When there's a rupture out of the necessity for rupture, like there is at the moment, there's this, there's this... Well, there's abandonment. It comes with an abandonment, which is also leads to rapture. Abandonment, did you say? Abandonment, rupture. Well, rupture. It, yeah, because to me, it feels almost more like being overwhelmed. You know, it's like, like a rupture is like something that breaks you, you know, in some sense, right? And, um, and like there's the, the rupture to me feels like just some kind of um, release that accompanies that process, almost like where it just, you let it just wash over you um or you're overwhelmed by it. I'm, not, I'm not sure i'm not sure it's kind of interesting i wouldn't really normally have associated these two states but when i was looking at the the images like particularly at the joan of arc images and or you know some of these images of, of people's faces where they had both this combination of rupture and rapture that's sort of how it looked to me when i was looking at the images i mean certain symptoms at the moment the present so the symptoms of the last two years have been painterliness, a sort of a sort of bliss of paint or pleasure of paint, and a kind of um, forgetting of time, a kind of way of looking at figures like 
Rococo paintings and reinscribing them or painting us of Velasquez and reinscribing. But a lot of the uh, painters in demand are, are very painterly. Uh, Do you think that's part of the taste for materiality that is very current? It's a taste for rapture, the rapture of paint. There's mm. that it sets a certain kind of exuberance, a kind of sheer pleasure, and a, a, no. a responsible pleasure, a kind of abandonment of in, indexicality. Mm. Do you think it's also related to uh, like a return to like the the mark of the artists or like the the presence of the material presence of the artist in the work, like? There's a kind of excess of subjectivity that the marks the inscription the, is also a mark on here. Um, sort of, you have to set up a kind of intensity to make a registration. So the, the mark is both a physical mark, but it's also a mark of subjectivity. Which is another form of, I mean, it's believed, in other words, it's authentic. And for a, for a long period, in, let's say the Brit art period, inauthenticity was the, uh, an irony with the mark. So there's another way of saying that this period of the contemporary has been passed over now. And we, we've got the, um, introduction of ideas increasingly to do with world art. So it, it, it's, it's come with a, a kind of whole, I mean, just the whole constellation of new names of artists, African and um, Middle Eastern and anywhere. Um, so it's unhinged. The whole of modernity. It's hybridities as well, isn't it? Hybrid voices and new gestures and regressions as well. So returns as much as progressions. Doesn't give you necessarily a schema of hope. It gives you a schema of a sort of sheer presence. It's not strategic. Modernity was always strategic, especially later modernity. Always knew what, why the mark was being made and why the gesture was being made and why the what where it was in its place. If it's not strategic, then what is it? Like intuitive, compulsive, spontaneous. It's uh, excessive. Just it's just um, it's abandoned. Doesn't have to say or do anything. It just has to be. Would you put like a painter like uh, like Michael Armitage in that category of because that goes more towards the. I don't know. It's excessive in a way, but it's also figurative. But there's a lot of figurative art. I mean, he fits with the uh, textural SS, you know, so his paintings are made out of Ugandan bark cloth. Mm. And it's got a lot of striation in it and a lot of density. And it performs something, it performs the return. And it falls back on modernity. It's sort of like, a, I always look to sound like Gauguin and doesn't want to fall into the trap of being a, a producing um, you know utopian vision, sort of quite dark, dark dreams and good painter, physically very good painter. Did you see his last one at the White Cube in Bermondsey? 
No, I didn't. I saw it was one at the South London Gallery. I mean, there was a person who <clears throat> I thought about this also. I didn't think of it directly, but now when he paints, there's like only one layer to the painting. In his older paintings, he was often the the. I heard it from somebody who studied with him that he wasn't like a great success in school. I think he went to the Slade, so he would constantly paint over. Went to the Slade in the Royal Academy. Yeah, so he had to paint over his painting or sections all the time because he wasn't happy with it and he created this very layered approach. Mm. And now I think that's what I saw, like when I saw his work six or seven years ago, when you got closer to them, they became better. But the ones that are there now, it's like, it's a little way, the way little like how you described um, um, Bacon in the way that he's found, he's found his kind of formula and then he's working with the formula and the surface doesn't have the same kind of layering anymore. Yeah. I mean, the same happened with Peter Doig. Mm. Um, I mean, Peter Doig is his paintings, which uh, is when he was painting, each painting was a new event, a new problem of painting, a new problem of the image, a new, so you, you got the feeling that it was a unique, Occurrence, and then suddenly they started becoming Peter Dogs, and you you lost that sense of a signature. So, so if we're talking about the mark and the gesture and this authenticity, how, who are we looking at it with sculpture, in regards to sculpture? Who's working in this way? There is this one guy. I don't really like his work at all, but he's he was in the last years. Uh, so last year on the Free Sculpture Park, he makes these figurative work, like almost the Roman sculptures where it usually has like a crystal or something within them. I, I personally don't like his work, but I would, he works very figuratively and very like mark making in the similar way, like uh, you would have with old sculpt uh, clay sculptures where it's very like hands-on. But I think like in sculpture, I've seen it less than in painting this, the similar like mark making approach perhaps in ceramics it's become like what i've seen in ceramics the last few years has been more prominent there uh, but maybe it's always been more prevalent there i'm not sure um, and you've got also another thing which is happening is um craft has changed its status so very elevated status for like people working with craft as a medium. I think that also at the same time, like there's this DM or this move away from um, artists being applauded for having other people doing their work. And there's more interest in art artists who are their own crafts people. I think that's now. a very significant issue. Uh, I mean, it became almost a given that people were getting um, other people's, I mean, the businesses which were set up to make other people's work. So you could get anything made, ready to order. There were fabricators and businesses which had skilled fabricators and you just went along and said, I want, this is the, uh, the work I want to make, make it for me. How much is it going to cost? And uh, there's a lot of editions of sculpture, so editions of six, as so I in, implied fabricators doing that as editions. And you got, um, you go to a casting business and you see like 30 sculptures by a very well known artist, all being manufactured in different, different. Um, sizes so the same work but three four different sizes in editions of six so as if the gallery had taken over the uh, the artist's work and the artist was just doing signatures of things which were someone had worked out a production schema or you got uh, people like anish kapoor with big factories and they'd send off uh, additions to be manufactured by 
the people who do Boeing aircraft or, I don't know, like very high tech or Jeff Koons doing things which had almost an impossible level of skill. So they made it something exclusive because you've never seen this casting before. Um, so it went with very high prices. But I think the, the, the sort of cynicism with additions, which, you know, you've got three different levels, like a fashion company where you get couture, um, mid-level, mid-range diffusion and popular, popular label. So art and fuse with fashion in terms of production. And so I think you've got to move against that. So painting has come back because you've got one off. You haven't got addition of six. So people fight over, I've got the best one. Um, so like in the individual. Individualize, get a return to the individual and to authenticity as, as well. It's a skill. So skills back and expressive and, you know, the narrative of artists is back, but in a different way, kind of more, less, um, less Damien Hirst, less, um, less boyish and like much more gentle, subtle. It seems too like the um, the pandemic period asked people to look inward and people started trying to learn to do things, people that maybe hadn't experienced doing craft before or whatever the YouTube explosions and all that. So lots and lots and lots of people are having unique individual somatic experiences perhaps. And then when we return back out into the art world, there there is this uh, on the viewer side, this desire to see something that's been touched and crafted and made, or sort of a more, a deeper understanding of what it is to touch something and try to make something. I don't know, I've been reading a bit about um, that as an occurrence. What do you think in terms of your own work? What, what, what's the uh, lockdown done? The lockdown made me more interested in mesmerization, like isolation as a as a space for ritual and mesmerization and repetition, mm -hmm. which sort of allowed a, a time warp kind of portal and a lot and some and some introspection. As intensification. Sorry? Forms of intensification. Yes, yes. Forms of intensification for sure. Magnitudes on magnitudes. I think all the way to, um, yeah, into uh, ritualistic. Um, because also the, the rupture, the idea, I remember you saying once uh, that um, the rupture occurs because it has to, but when it occurs, everything spills out. Every, it comes from a fullness and that everything that comes out is then equal, like after a flood, you know, when everything is poured out and everything is wet. So it doesn't matter if it's this or if it's that. So it destroys hierarchy and creates space for remixing. So that, I think that allowed for some sort of intensification, that concept of rupture as being a, a playground of rule dissolution or boundary dissolution. You've just written a, uh, an abstract for an exhibition. <laughs> yes. Come have one. <laughs> but it's interesting how it, it allows for a voice to emerge, which doesn't mind its own difference. It's not, not 
it's not, it's not strategic in relationship to the contemporary and to fashion. It's it's let loose. I think it was a powerful uh, statement about why the rupture occurs when you, when you gave a previous lecture on rupture that uh, that insistence of the bound the the idea that the of the boundary dropping. I've forgotten. <laughs> I'll send it back to you. But yeah, there was this idea of the boundary dropping. And I think, um, you know, I really fixated on that as a permission and a window that needed to stay open so that things could continue sloshing around, you know, rather than it being seamed back up and tidied back up, but that there, that, that messiness gave some sort of uh, freedom for the voice to arise. Yeah. Any other sort of things in the last two or three years which have happened, which you think is something to pay attention to here? You're a maker, Sharon. Yeah, I am. And, and I, I think it's really interesting you talk about, you know, sort of that factory, that commercialization of art, just, it just got so ridiculous. It sort of ate itself, didn't it? I just so excessive. Um, but I think it's, it's all sort of turning in on itself. I mean, what's Damien Hirst doing, burning his artwork now and selling off the digital rights. I mean, just sort of craziness, really. Um, but we have this continual discussion between craft versus art and i don't know if we can ever let go of that boundary but i think it makes so much sense that people want to step out of this digital realm that we're talking about this sort of you know victor brought up of this sort of crazy self-fulfilling feeding sending you down something that just gets narrow and narrow as a pipeline um back to something which is more tangible back to something that make, is more human. And as a, as a maker, I'm wanting to move more and more into the, into the away from, I don't know, making objects and making art and, 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 and putting my fingerprints into the material and, and leaving them there. It's permanent, permanently. There's a really interesting Someone once said about Balinese culture, they don't have a word for art, but they have a concept of doing things well. It's a way of abolishing the distinction, isn't it? You just have distinctions that you want to make or wish to make. I love this Navajo idea you brought up tonight too about this, it's sort of like a site a site where the, the gods come and go, I think I think that's such a powerful idea that our art making can be that site, that site where we allow that, that channeling of those, that power and, the, and those ideas. It goes right back to the also begins with philosophy and the idea of the templum where the gods come close to the earth. And templum is the root of the word contemplation. And it also links the idea of wonder, that you go to the festival to experience the wonder of this templum coming close to the earth. And uh, so the root of philosophy is wonder, it's not knowledge. We need that more than ever, don't we? That that ability to stop and to wonder. And maybe lockdown helped us all with that. That sort of stopping of the merry-go-round and stop getting off for a bit. I think there's something really to that about that, like a, a craving or a desire, like when you're talking about imprinting yourself or being with the making, that uh, it's like we all crave this intimate, somatic experience and the ability to to share it but intimately there is this sort of yeah heightened desire for intimacy 
which kind of started for me through these tiles, you know, like it's, it's so close to intimate. Mm -hmm. You're in bed with me right now. <laughs> and so far apart. But yeah, but then you can just pop off and pop back in. I mean, they're just, you, you, your picture can go and then you can arrive back in. I've been noticing nature becoming more beautiful over the last, I don't know, maybe like three weeks or so, I say I would notice this change. I don't know if anybody else <laughs> has had this experience, but like, but I mean, literally like several times in the last two or three weeks, like, like I'm like walking along and I actually have to stop because it's so beautiful like it's so beautiful i'm just like where did this beauty come from um i so say that's like a brand new thing that started happening which i think is kind of curious and i wonder if it's kind of like related to a sort of just a sense of you know Oh, kind of the, chaos everywhere else <laughs> it's like nature is looking more and more and more and more incredible all the time you start <laughs> it's just like wow are we just getting older there jessica i feel the same but i'm almost well, i don't even maybe I've, only in the last two weeks i'm not sure how it's like it's very sudden it's very sudden but it's like the last yeah two or three weeks it's been like knocking me did you start micro dosing I was like walking along the canal the other night and you know I mean it's like a pretty industrial stretch of canal here but it was very dark so you just had like the, you know the water the water and dark and a little bit of lights but I mean I, I swear to god like I actually just had to stop I couldn't even walk anymore I was just like this is ludicrous how beautiful this is so yeah I don't know anything I'm noticing Check it out. I wonder if that sort of <laughs> slightly relates to you know thinking about the talk this evening and um, the thing between looking and gazing you know that uh, ability to almost sort of release your focus and and in the process of your um, your vision being less essential um, your mind kind of relaxes outwards and your body takes over in terms of receiving information. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if it's a little bit, you know, it's almost like when you look at a view and you're, for once, your focal point, because we're all so kind of on everything, we're focusing all the time, and a, a view, a distant view gives you that ability to relax your gait and, and move into the sort of gaze phase rather than looking phase um and in some way it kind of opens up your body doesn't it? it sort of opens up that somatic you know um experience of what what's around you and you kind of you're somehow sort of open to something that's so much more than everything that's visible and it, it's more than just sound and it's it's more than smell it's just mm. like a, a whole opening up mm. um, feeling i mean there's also an argument to be made that the more you look at art the more the world in itself becomes more beautiful i mean or, or the way like oscar wilde has these ideas of well so he's describing how we never thought fog was beautiful until turner painted fog so it's this where like the idea that life replicates art rather than the way all the way around so when we start looking at paying better attention to to things visually um be them paintings or other things then the world around you kind of resonates more strongly you just train that part of your head in a way i think that uh goes to noticing mm -hmm. you know it's like it's also something to do with the kind of um seeing the magic seeing the magic within things, seeing the, the extraordinary, um, you know, when you shift your perspective, if you, it's a bit like viewing something as a child, you know, where yeah. you, you don't yeah. understand the science of something. Yeah. So it, it, it's magical. Um, there was a quote that came across recently and somebody said, you know, either you're, either, either you're someone who sees 
nothing is exceptional or you're someone who sees everything as exceptional I'm garbling that but it's like it's the same thing it's just like you know everything can be incredible if you have the right attitude you know I mean because it is in like incredible and it's the openness you know, it's, for it. it's just the openness to surprise isn't it so it comes with surprise so you you stop and you think why am i finding this beautiful it's not that you just find it beautiful you find, and say why yeah, am I finding that, this why? and that's it so i'm like i was looking for a reason you know and that's why i had to stop it i didn't i just didn't understand how it could be so it was like what is going on really strange sort of feeling actually i've had something similar it's funny you say it um i had something similar i i watched um the Werner herzog film um the fire within don't know if everyone's seen it but it's on iplayer at the moment oh it's on iplayer i think it's on iplayer or netflix something like that anyway it's absolutely amazing but it's completely changed how i see things it, it's so bizarre how it's um i was looking at the sea this morning as the light was passing through the water and i i felt like i was in that the Werner herzog movie this is absolutely brilliant yeah and it's sort of elemental it's so could you feel it in the somewhere yeah yeah patrick you've been silent tonight Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I was um, rendering a few photos that I was applying for them to get them done. I can't hear you, Patrick. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, I I was rendering some stuff that I needed to use for um, something I was applying for, and I need to get it done tonight. So, I'm honest of you. <laughs> But it's, it's done now. And actually, it was using so many of my resources. I couldn't, I couldn't, I almost had to turn the camera off. I was like, it's done now. Someone said to me they went to see the therapist, and the therapist was reading a book. They caught the therapist reading a book, and he said, You're reading a book? He said, So? Said, I don't want to listen to you. Just, just get on with it. I'll read my book, and you talk. <laughs> I was thinking, I was thinking, um, because I read something recently, I've read it, reread something recently. I was thinking about, um, craft versus art because, um, it, it comes up in this, a lot of the stuff. Um, I mean, now we're talking, now we're talking kind of ancient Greek stuff, right? Um, for the, for Plato in a lot of the work, the, a lot of Plato's writings, um, the craftsman is, 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 is has a very high status, and the artist is um, is a deceiver, not trustworthy, um, somebody who's not to be a, not to be um, a deluder, somebody who creates copies of things that aren't real copies, whereas the craftsperson creates exact copies and and copies the essence of a thing. Um, and I, I, uh, I think that's a, it's still a very interesting dialogue. And also the other thing I remember reading about, and I can't quite place where it was, um, this idea that um, humour or Greek humour was um, with, um, with, with, um, irony. And I think it was Deleuze probably I was reading. Um, at some, I think he kind of stopped doing this, but at some point he was a, he was trying to be anti, well, this is part of his anti platonism thing, right? He was trying to, attack irony as um I don't know, uh, maybe modernist i don't quite know how to place but what, what 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 i mean platonist basically um and looking for a different type of humor that was you know the humor of a clown and i don't I, I thought it was actually really quite a strong argument i can't remember where i read it but i believe he just dropped it i mean I, I, actually he dropped the stuff a lot when he moved worked on the or toward stuff and moved into the um you know the body and the organs but I think it was quite an interesting thread and this kind of was another attempt to rethink Plato or overcome Plato <laughs> I was thinking about that just the other day um Plato's craft and I, the, I also read recently how this perception of craft is I think quite an in, quite a British thing I'm not sure it's quite the same view 
in other countries. I don't know. Is that the same statement that we were making today true in the US to the same extent? Or is that a British perspective? Mm. No, it's absolutely the same in the US. Yeah. My grandmother was a was a quilt maker. She made I, I mean I mean it's in the art world. I mean I don't mean yeah, but I mean, I think it's I think it's true. I think it was true too that that craft was considered, a, you know, non-European art in general was considered craft for a long time before that hierarchy was overcome, and and yeah, there's something being embraced about that. Also, when you're talking about COVID, did the craft in Japan, a lot of national treasures of craft makers. So craft is, has a sort of very high status in Japan. Yeah. What's the name of that Japanese sculptor that had a show last year at the Barbican who makes also makes these lamps that are, what's his name? Zaguchi. Huh? Zaguchi. Zaguchi, yeah. Um, it was a quote in that exhibition where he talked about like um, making things and he said, you have to be good enough to make them well, but not good enough for not good enough to become a, because then then, be, then you become a craftsman. And as like an artist to practice a lot of like as an artist to use a lot of different techniques and stuff, there is something to be said. I mean, in the difference between craftsmen and artists, from that perspective, in that the craftsman can be too focused on technique and too detached from kind of creating a sense of surprise or something new or like there is there is a i'm not sure i agree with that but there is i think there is some difference in approach to a person who would consider them purely a craftsperson or craftsman rather than an artist who uses craftsmanship techniques however developed i think that's the same argument that the Louis was having um with plato that was kind of also, it is, it is aesthetic, um, a pre impression of aesthetics, um, a new type of aesthetic, um, referring to the same thing. I mean, that's what it means by not copying the essence of things, but trying to undermine the essence of something. Um, so not being a craftsman. Um, so another really figure. Tricky. Go on. So this thing is really tricky, though, as well, because like I would say that you know, if you look at like uh, Renaissance. Uh, realist oil painting you see I'd say that's craft I'd say that like there's so much craft in that um and all right you may not be like what's different is that you're not like producing something sort of self-similar but but in a way you are because the craft is a training that started when you were like 12 and had you repetitively repetitively over and over and over and over and over again for years and years and years and years and years just painting the same things over and over and over and over again until you got to the point where you could make that unique one off but like the amount of craft that is in that piece of art is makes it craft to me i agree but i think painting but painting is unique in that sense that it's so i agree that it like requires a lot of craft to do it successfully at least those kind of ways but i would argue that painting is different from other art forms in that it carries a much like more self-reflective more philosophical reflection uh not just in like the craft in itself includes everything that has to do with color and composition of the space and the choice of subject and all of these aspects come into play rather than just the technique of knowing how to do it it's the choice of what to do and in yeah. painting it's when I don't know, you know, I'd say that like, you could even take that to its extreme and say you know if you think about it it's in, you know very like uh you know like there was a like there was a sort of a language to to the portraiture and like the you know <clears throat> it was i don't know i'd say it's like 98 percent craft maybe two percent not but i think that's all it was like i'd say it's 98 percent craft really it's you know because if like if it was you know the like the way that it's studied is like you know studying the anatomy and then um the the body and how it moves and so on um but then if the other thing that was studied was like 
was um, cloth and how it hangs. And there was almost as much attention given to that as there was to, to the other, because it was the same symbols that were being used over and over and over again. People in these elaborate dresses with like fabric backdrops or whatever, you know? And so isn't that like a repetition over and over? Like how much individual uh, like artistic choice was there compared to how much craft there was? I'd say it's overwhelmingly craft. But you get the, the introduction of the notion of genius into the Renaissance and with genius, you get the idea that genius is that you able to break the rule, introduce a new rule. And so it's this idea of genius and introducing a new rule that elevates it beyond craft. So you get this idea, this figure of genius, yeah. but the overwhelming practice is craft, but you get the geniuses who, and we all know the names of these things which are yeah, but I, I think that's and right. I think it's the, the actual practicing of it itself, because what you're, you know, you, what you're focusing on is the craftsmanship, and the, and the artistry is what comes through you without you being responsible for it largely, but, but, and that's the genius, you know, but, as and when it comes. But that doesn't always occur, and so I think actually true genius or that that. It's, it's what you're aiming for always is that when that craft and that practice elevates it to something greater than just being a great craftsperson. So just being able to paint amazing velvet drapery is not enough. I don't know. I don't, I actually, I don't know. I don't know how big a distinction it is. It's like, this is like, it's mastery is what you're talking about. Like, mastery, you mastery, talk but, about but, like, but, the, the, like the, is it a sitar player the, that you put up in your yeah you know it's like that's craft right that is somebody who has mastered their craft and taken it to the point where it has become transcendent but it's still craft well i mean the player is a good example because you can learn how to play it in one way but you write the song and i mean there's a composer and their player but i think it's harder to argue with in music i mean there is an artistry within the craft that the way you execute things i don't think it's like one thing or another it's like a sliding spectrum of both like the way you approach even a craft can be artistic in a way like there i think it's too hard to say put a percentage this much is this and this much is that but i do agree that there is like a the I, ones I who break the rules are the ones we remember kind of thing but it's also when you don't have to think about it anymore that actually that's when it's true mastery. So when we're not thinking about it being a sitar with those incredible notes, or we're not thinking about it being painted like the most amazing velvet, that's when you've arrived. That's what you're aiming for. That's that true mastery or that true genius. It's forget, you just forget actually what you're looking at. And I think that's, that's when it moves out of that field of craft or crafting. Um, I think you're right on to something there that in that place you're overcoming technique like you have technique and you have tactics and you can learn these things in school you're taught like technical would be terps and medium and thinning and layers and drawing and all that stuff and tactical might be narrative or bas relief or whatever it is you know and then but that's still like if you think about the like the learning teaching and learning model copy choose create you can get really technically proficient and still be in choose. And that create part is where you get Titian or somebody like that who has all that training and capacity. And rather than honing it until it transcends, they transcend their training and let go of it and sort of trust that it's there. Mm -hmm. And that that's where the create comes, you know, those that I think that it sounds to me, the Sharon, like what you're saying, like that, the losing yourself or the disappearing into yeah so that's like that's interesting though because it is then that it's the craft that is the process that creates that if you see what i mean that like, because but if it you weren't for that training it you wouldn't can... like that's how they access their mastery is through the training right and so it, it gives a very important position to craft i would say um because it's like it's the it's necessary at least you have to know what you're letting go of you know, in order to like, like you um, have to, you know, you're because you, you're not just start returning to your starting point. You're not completely letting go. It's just it's you're not. not it doesn't. It's no longer dominating you. You know, you're able to, to work with it with mastery. 
at some point uh, over the course of time from that extreme to modernism all of that mastery it may still be we're still there but it wasn't used it was it went went to the other extreme to show that you can make great works of art without that mastery mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. without knowing that mastery what you needed was the idea that you're effective the new idea that you're introducing that that was really i mean we may have gone against all of that now but we may be going away from that now but we've been to that extreme where there was nothing on the canvas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still, still mastery because you didn't have to demonstrate that we could do this craft we, the craft is a tool but it doesn't make the art it's just something you can use or not use right i mean not knowing knowing when not to use it is I important no i'm not sure if i agree with that wholeheartedly actually i think that there's i think that there's something very in, there's something like very powerful about the the practice like you know when like it, it, you are literally rewiring your brain if you do a repetitive task for several hours over many years like several hours a day over many years you know it has to be both intense and prolonged for this to happen but if you do that for a number of years you you literally rewire your brain you know you can like you can you can some you know you might have you might be able to like literally double the amount the size of your brain the portion of your brain that is dedicated to visual processing like you mean, those but... sorts of magnitudes of changes occur in these people who go through this mastery of this training and this craft right so i like i totally agree with you patrick that it's also weirdly non-essential right you can have mastery without the craft you can have art without the craft but I still think there's something actually really, really important. This it is a transformational process that's occurring with this very dedicated and like prolonged training. And of course, like why why would that not be the case if if we didn't? Why would our education system be the way that it is if it didn't have that sort of effect? Right? This is like millennia and millennia and millennia of ways of training people. It's it's not you know what I mean. I think it's totally fascinating in its own right you can take that same idea of training and training and and untake undo all of the um you can work toward the toward the simpler like once you build all of those skill sets or you have all those skill sets or you come from a uh educational background or an art historical background which holds as an archive all of that material for you you can have a practice which is emptier and emptier and emptier, as Patrick is suggesting. I think Patrick, correct me if I'm wrong, but you you know you can lead in as as deep a way toward this emptiness as you can toward this creation of right, freedom in velvet. <laughs> I think I think in the, in the sculptural field there are also I got I know there are a few in the tape, a few small sculptures. I'm not going to be able to remember their name. They look but they're really badly made, but they're made by experts, if you see what I mean. They, you couldn't make that if you weren't, if you didn't know exactly what you were doing. Um, I mean, I think there's quite a lot of modernist sculpture that falls into that category. Um, and now I'm not talking about things that were made with, with the chisel. They, these are things that, these are boxes, painted boxes and things like that. They were not made by people who didn't have skills or craft. They, they, it took a, a great amount of skill to make such a, you describe it puny thing or something it's not so easy to make something that um is great and yet, yet not not just pure craft it's not so easy um I mean, maybe we're not interested in seeing that now maybe we're moving in back i mean we kind of go backwards and forwards maybe we're going to a time period now where everyone wants to see the craft at the extreme I don't know. It's like a pendulum, no? And I think like the idea of surprise is quite important because when people get tired of seeing one thing, I mean, you know, we often look at it from a point of respecting of the creator because we make things, but a lot of it is dictated by what people look at and one of what people want to look at and what they have been seeing. Um, and that, that influences also like what we end up looking at later. I, I feel like we didn't let trying... Jonathan speak when he was going to speak, so he just zoned out. <laughs> <laughs> Dissolved. Jonathan, come back. <laughs> We're only here for you. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to come back as a velvet painting. Oh, yeah, that would be nice.
<laughs> Victor, I think your point though is really good that um, you know we like what is what we're familiar with, and we have these this tool Instagram that that is likening and evening and saming art. We, we're looking at a lot of the same stuff, and a lot of the same stuff is being produced because we're not in search necessarily of what creates the new or what makes the new arise. You know, we're we're sort of entrapped with this idea of making sure that it's liked or viable or can sell or I don't know. Yeah. A lot of creation is destroy uh, destruction, isn't it? So so you break and that's I was thinking it's you can do I want to send a rocket launcher at it. Like yeah, a that's, pendulum, you know? And that's uh, that's the rupture. This is historically is also a way of creating transition is by destroying and the uh, and uh, it opens the new. Uh, so there's not much craft. I, I think sense. that the uh, that the introduction of craft may actually be a, a radical move at this. Point moment maybe maybe more from a i don't know this might be a super controversial thing to say but from a female perspective that i remember when i went to art school first in the 90s i was told like don't sew don't use fabric don't use anything that can indicate woman you won't be taken seriously you'll be relegated to the realm of craft like i had a professor say it to me you know if you want to be taken seriously don't touch any of that stuff don't talk about it <laughs> and so to have uh, to see shows where there's embroidery and sewing and stitching and 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 all different kinds of making weaving and that it's cross gender and that all different kinds of people are using it feels like this massive influx of allowability in material and technical like you can pick and choose from whichever craft suits the making impulse, which seems new to me. Yeah, it's true, but I think it's still not yet. It's got a long way to go, but I think you're right. There seems to be a lot more of it out there. It's definitely gendered. It's very gendered. Well, it has been in the past, definitely. Yeah, but it's also very cultural, isn't it? <clears throat> it's quite territorial, actually. Mm. And so there's there's a sort of a marking of a territory, you know, it's not, you can't not, not just anybody can do any craft, actually, I think it's not an open invitation for that necessarily, unless it's extended. Culturally. Mm. Yes, yeah, 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 because then we end up in, in co-opting land and, and other ethical and moral considerations, of course. Mm. Does anyone who'd like to summarize today? He's back. <laughs> Did anyone like some? I was only away for <laughs> emissions. Um, does anyone like to summarize? Well, what, what, what have we done today? We've learned that rupture and rapture go together, which I didn't know before, so that was helpful for me. <laughs> it's a rumor. <laughs> Piece of make believe. I learned that what differentiates painters if as is is if they use uh, more uh, masking tape or not. <laughs> masking tape. <laughs> <laughs> you realize how absurd a lot of the history of art is. Yeah. And also how we see it from such a Western canon perspective as well. I learned an image is a circle which is always tracing an image around itself. That's so nice. That's Jonathan. Oh, it's not Jonathan. It's what's her name? Lilio. Lilio. Uh, Did she also put the, the, the sentence confusing noise with the inclination towards the profound? Yeah. That was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to have a drink with Lilio.
I might have to do a bigger presentation on Lilio. Yeah. yeah. I think so. I think so. We want to, we want to see her work. Profile maybe, maybe we could see some of her more recent work. <laughs> Victor, yeah. if you, you need if to bring that mash up, we want to do that mash up. Do what? the mashup um, image thing and put in Lilio and plus artwork. No, plus no, no, no. This is way above some stupid AI bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear more from Lilio on the idea of there being a still image being the stimulation of such unanswerable questions. That was my favorite thing. A still image, the stimulation of unanswerable questions, like an event. And also, I'm going away to try and think about if the, um, I love this idea of images being uh, next to each other side by side, and on, above is only black, but I want to know what's below. So now Lilio has homework. <laughs> Were there any um, art critics who wrote about Lilio? No one got caught. Okay. We can invent one. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of there's lots of wait stuff waiting to be done. But I was uh, I mean partly I was interested in the the space of making a kind of a presentation which is closer to being an artwork than a, a sort of didactic or intellectual construct. Something which is a um, way of being with um, voices and images. I, mean, I didn't put names to the, uh, the images and say, oh, this is a work by so-and-so. This is a sort of derealization of history and images were just images. I have to stand for themselves. I think it worked very well. Yeah, it was great. It, it creates the desire to know what it is and there's quietness in that place. So it sort of is the hook, you know, you're kind of have to look at it for as long as you allow us to see it too. And that's all you get. Anyway, it'll be put online. It'll be put on the archive so you can look at it again. And I'll uh, make available the uh, novel as a, I think it's about 100,000 words, the story of Lilia. Well, it's not called the story of Lilia, it's called... Uh, <laughs> it should be. <laughs> it's called the story of Lilia. What's it called, Jonathan? What's it called? I think it's got a title with addiction. It's addiction inscription, I think. Excription been written out. Great. She says some really beautiful things, funny things about um, the uprising in Bologna. It's very good. <laughs> um, Conversation's officially gone very weird. <laughs> she calls herself a leftist. She, she calls herself a leftist galleon because she doesn't want to be called a Marxist. <laughs> she has conversations with policemen. She <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> and another <Yeah>. time. <laughs> okay. Brilliant. All right, dinner next week then. Yeah. Excellent. See you guys on Monday. Yeah. Uh, we, we've um, got this sort of really interesting dynamic. I mean, everyone's talking and uh, I wonder what, um, I wonder how much we, we can build up the archive. I mean, we can make the um, site also a place where works can be put on where we can have a space for making works. Um, anyway, we've got plenty of time to develop, but I think that's where we could grow. Yeah, we were t Patrick and I were talking a little bit about this over the weekend, actually. Um, and uh, I think it would be good. 
I think we should aim. I think we should have. Um, it'd be good to have something to aim for. I think, like you know, an exhibition or something for us to work on together. Do you know what I mean? Um, we can have a obviously have a think about what that would involve, but I think that would it'd be a it would add some it add its own momentum if we were working towards something. In just a year, the the. The uh, texture of the meetings has just changed really dramatically. All the inhibition of talking has sort of disappeared.